Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Me Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Me Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. She is one of the world's top global macro experts. Her new book just came out. It's already a bestseller. It has rave reviews, and it's now available on audiobook on Audible and also on the Amazon website. You can get it on audiobook. Go and download it like I just did in the last week. It is Broken Money, Why Our Financial System is Failing Us and How We Can Make It Better. She also has a global macro newsletter. She has a free version and a paid version, so you can check that out later after the interview. Lynn Alden, thank you for joining me again. Thanks for having me back. So Lynn, we're recording this interview on Monday, March 11th, 2024. Crazy times in asset prices right now. We have Bitcoin. It just made a new all-time high, over $72,000. The US dollar gold price has finally joined the gold prices in other fiat currencies. The US dollar gold price has rallied a lot in the last three months. It looked like it was going to crash a couple of months ago. Suddenly now it's almost at $2,200. I think it briefly hit $2,200 last week. It's at $2,180 right now. And then also you have like this weird st- uh, weird divergence of capital flows, liquidity flows. Maybe it's flight capital from China and Europe going into money market funds, short-term treasuries, and MAG7. Do you think that this is a symptom of the broken money that you wrote about in your book? I do. I think um, a lot of what's driving, I, I think, this current period is is the fiscal deficits. Um, and so a lot of uh, investors and analysts um, put a lot of emphasis on monetary policy, so things that the Federal Reserve is doing. Um, and I think that they don't necessarily put enough emphasis on what fiscal policymakers are doing uh, or, uh, in some context, what they did decades ago and uh, now kind of the, they, the deficits manifest themselves now. Um, and so one thing I've been emphasizing really ever since um, kind of the beginning of 2020 with all of like the COVID stimulus and stuff um, is that people are just uh, underemphasizing the importance of fiscal. Um, and even now that we're kind of past like the COVID era stimulus, um, there are still just structurally large deficits. Um, some of it's now related to basically entitlement spending as, as the baby boomers kind of fully uh, enter their retirement years. Uh, so it kind of shifts uh, the, the uh, you know, kind of less input, more output uh, in those um, programs, uh, Medicare and Social Security. Uh, and then also um, when you raise interest rates and you have well over 100% debt to GDP, that blows out your interest expense. Uh, and there are entities that are on the receiving side of that interest expense, which they can then spend into the economy. And so the the government's running a multi-trillion dollar deficit, which has implications for nominal GDP growth, inflation, asset prices, and all that all that sort of thing. And Biden's 2025 fiscal budget just came out today. I'm not sure if you took a look at it. The projections are downright scary. $7.3 trillion in projected spending by the federal government for 2025 fiscal year. They're projecting the tax receipts to go up by a trillion dollars. I think they collected a little over $4.4 trillion in tax receipts for the last full year. They're projecting tax receipts to go up to $5.5 trillion. And yet, Lynn, the budget deficits are, are going to be around $1.8 trillion, even if those assumptions are true. Yeah, a lot of times when you look at these like long-term budgets, they're often um, they underestimate the size of the budgets that happen. They often predict no recessions. Um, they often predict like interest rates go back to down to some kind of like um, baseline level. Uh, and so usually the deficit surprise to the upside. Uh, you know, some years it can come in a little bit below, um, but but structurally over any kind of multi-year period, it tends to keep surprising to the upside. And um, I, you know, I've been making the comparison for a while that the 2020s are like the 1940s in terms of the monetary and fiscal environment. And um, I, I think that's still on track, basically. Like we have this kind of structural deficit-driven backdrop and um, that's still catching a lot of investors off guard. Uh, that That's a very different environment. The, basically the sheer size of the deficit as a percentage of GDP outside of a recession is um, pretty like uh, remarkable in modern history, uh, and it's it's even uh, it's bigger than the deficit you generally see in Europe. It's it's um, bigger than the deficit you see in Japan, uh, and that just has pretty big implications for um, economic metrics, inflation metrics, asset price uh, metrics, and all that sort of stuff. Have you ever seen anything in financial history where government budget deficits this side have been deflationary? Not this size, no. Um, You have to compare them to other disinflationary forces. And so, for example, if you look at the Japan case uh, over the past 20 years or so, uh, they had the slowest broad money supply growth in the world uh, during that time. 
uh, and basically had two competing forces. On one hand, you had um, uh, like decades of corporate deleveraging. So back in like you know the the bubble of like the early nineties, uh, you had corporations were highly leveraged, like ex- exceedingly high levels of leverage. And over the subsequent years, they started to gradually deleverage. And as you pay back debt and as you deleverage, that um, is it reduces the broad money supply and it is disinflationary. Um, but on the other hand, you were, they were running pretty sizable monetized f- uh, fiscal deficits um, that were a little bit larger uh, each year on average than the um, amount of corporate deleveraging. So basically a way to kind of think of it is um, every year they were running maybe 5% of GDP monetized deficits uh, and they were shrinking, uh, they were doing like 2% a year GDP in corporate deleveraging. So you're kind of left with positive 3% and that was roughly the money supply per capita that they were experiencing uh, for the for that period of time. Uh, and so it wasn't it wasn't particularly inflationary in CPI terms, um, but it was kind of uh, anti-deflationary uh, against all of the um, other like the private sector disinflation that would have happened. So sometimes measuring the counterfactual is the hard part because the baseline for inflation is not necessarily zero; it's often negative. So technology, t- as technology gets better. That should bring prices down. That should be deflationary. And anytime you have some degree of private sector deleveraging, that should be deflationary. Um, so anytime you get kind of still positive inflation anyway, uh, often because of either monetary or fiscal policy or both, you're offsetting some negative number and bring it into positive territory. The macro conditions, there's also a lot of cross currents. And when I study financial history, I'm reminded of kind of the the few years prior to the October 1929 crash because there was similar global macro cross cross currents back then. A lot of the other major economies before the October 1929 crash were also in a recession or depression. There was a lot of currency debasement by governments back then. There was a lot of flight capital too, similar to now, I think, where there's a lot of flight capital leaving China, leaving the European Union, leaving emerging markets. It came into the United States stock market. And there was a a lot of people are not aware of this. There was actually a tech bubble at the time too, prior to the October 1929 crash. I went and looked it up. There was radio stocks and they soared similar to NVIDIA now. So I'm just seeing a lot of crazy similarities. Uh, Yeah, it is, I think, in many cases, similar to that. Um, I think what's different is that that era was less deficit driven. Um, So, you know, I think, The closest comparison we have to the 1929 scenario was like the 2006 scenario with the housing bubble. Um, Because when you look at kind of the private sector, uh, say, for example, debt to monetary base ratios uh, and um, overall money multipliers, um, the 2000s decade looked a lot like the 1920s, with the difference being that the, the most excesses were in the real estate market rather than the stock market. Um, but there's, you know, there's certainly similarities today with, with, in terms of just overall euphoric positioning, um, plowing money into the really big tech stocks, for example, and di- different countries have different safe havens. So for example, uh, when foreign capital, um, or even domestic capital is in countries like Canada or many European countries or Australia, a lot of it goes into the real estate market. Uh, whereas in the US, because our stock market is so large and diverse and and like we have a very kind of corporatized culture, um, and kind of like the stock market's been a priority um uh for you know administrations uh and things like that. Um in the US, uh a lot of our excess capital and foreign capital tends to find its way to the stock market more so than the real estate market. And so our real estate valuations tend not to be excessive relative to the rest of the world, at least, whereas our stock market valuations tend to have a more structural valuation premium attached to them, even when you kind of compare sector by sector to other places. I interviewed Jesse Felder a couple weeks ago, and he was citing a, I think, Financial Times article or Economist article talking about how Chinese investors were paying a 30% premium to net asset value for access to MAG7. So, I mean, there is a lot of flight capital. I think Chinese investors, they're, I think they're definitely worried about a yuan devaluation. We could see gold and Bitcoin, I think, go a lot higher if there is a Chinese yuan devaluation, say, to eight Chinese yuan to the dollar. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't have a firm opinion on if the yuan is going to devalue against the dollar, but I do I do think you're right that a lot of capital has been going into those um, types of assets. And, you know, most of the gold support we see currently, like, you know, what, what kind of drove the breakout in gold was that foreign demand. So if you look at, say, U.S. domestic 
ETFs for gold, uh, they're really underwhelming. There's not a lot of investor appetite for gold um, uh, in kind of U.S. capital markets, let's say. Uh, whereas, you know, um, foreign uh, sovereign funds uh, and central banks are buying, and then also, of course, just kind of structural demand from India and China and, and other parts of Asia uh, from the private sector. Uh, and so I do think that that is a, a huge uh, source of inflows into gold and to some other safe haven assets, uh, probably including Bitcoin as well. Uh, and like you said, I mean, basically, there's there's market inefficiencies. And so entities will pay up pretty significant premium sometimes to access U.S. markets. Um, and that has been a a friction point for a lot of people around the world is either accessing dollars or accessing U.S. stocks or accessing U.S. treasuries. Um that you know, not everybody in every country can just access whatever you know uh, stock market they want. Like, um, you know, if you're middle class in a developing country, it's not necessarily easy for you to access like a U.S. brokerage account, for example. Uh, and yet, there's there is pretty significant demand around the world for U.S. stocks because when money is weak everywhere, people monetize scarcer things instead. So they monetize real estate, they monetize high quality equities, even if that means bringing their valuation up super high. Uh, they monetize just, you know, kind of anything else. They monetize fine art, for example, um, because the money's so weak and they don't want to store value in them. Uh, and so that's just kind of an ongoing thing that we're seeing. And, you know, even stocks like, it's not even just tech stocks, even stocks like Costco, for example, like uh, recently was trading at over 50 times earnings. I think now it's down into the high 40s, which is, uh, you know, Costco's a like the 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 fundamentals are doing great, but if you look at like the say the peg ratio, the price to earnings to growth ratio. You know this is like a four decade old you know retailer, um, and it, people are people are paying uh, as though it's like a you know software as a service business. They're they're paying it as though it's like a hyper growth stock um, because just capital kind of doesn't know where else to go. So just it piles into safe, profitable, strong balance sheet, large cap U.S. stocks at almost any price. So do you think a lot of this flag capital, whether it's China, emerging markets, maybe like Argentina, Venezuela, some of these, Turkey, some of these other countries where either there's a lot of evidence of currency debasement the last couple of years, a lot more than the US where there's inflation rate. I think Argentina, the official inflation rate is 200% per year over that still, despite Malay uh, doing some pretty good reforms, or at least it looks like it so far. Do you think that that's what's creating a lot of the Bitcoin demand lately? I think some of it. I mean, um, in, in those countries, it really depends. It's a country by country basis. Um, sometimes they're piling in a stable coin. Sometimes they're piling in the gold. Sometimes they're piling in a Bitcoin. Partially depends on the generation. Partially depends on the individual country. So, for example, in Argentina, there will be more stable coin and Bitcoin demand than Egypt, for example. Uh, it's it's kind of just a cultural difference. Um, whereas in Egypt, they'll pile into physical dollars if they can get them, uh, or gold, or you know things like local real estate. Um, and and so uh, we we are seeing kind of global demand, but I think that this particular rally was driven more so by U.S. capital markets, basically unlocking the Bitcoin ETFs. Um, people kind of seeing that, you know, Bitcoin's not dead again, um, it's kind of just like, you know, the overall regulatory clarity in the U S has increased. It's kind of like a buzzword, but it's, it's partially true. Um, so I, I think that, you know, some of the other cryptos have been driven partially by Asian capital, a lot of the, um, like tokenized gaming, uh, and, and that kind of thing, uh, that, that tends to become, uh, more so from, uh, Eastern uh, capital markets. Um, so, uh, but I think in for Bitcoin terms, a lot of it has been driven uh, from U.S. domestic capital, at least this particular kind of multi-month period. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the halving coming up, I think, in the next six weeks. And then also, if China does devalue the yuan, I think we could see uh, another big pop in the Bitcoin price. Maybe Bitcoin gets to $100,000 and gold goes above 3000 I mean, if if you're holding a lot of Chinese yuan in savings and the Chinese government's going to devalue massively another 20 30 percent, just a one off of the currency, I mean, it could get ugly. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, I, I would be surprised to not see Bitcoin get over 100000 in this cycle. Um, I, in the moment, it looks a little bit overbought, but you know, Bitcoin tends to do that during bull runs. Uh, if you look at MicroStrategy stock, I mean, they're trading at a very large premium over their NAV, uh, which is a sign of kind of localized euphoria. Um, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised to see pauses or corrections here and there. I mean, 
prior Bitcoin bull markets have had pretty violent corrections. Uh, the market structure might be a little bit different now because of the ETFs and just kind of pent up demand for them. Uh, so I don't really like when I say I'm bullish on Bitcoin, I don't really talk about any kind of multi month period because, you know, you're always prone to corrections. But I think when we look back at, say, the end of 2025, right? So let's give us almost two years. Uh, I, I still think that there's a lot of room to run from, from current prices uh, for Bitcoin, for gold. Um, and and potentially other assets as well. Like for example, I, I like energy stocks still. Do you think that a lot of the asset price movements lately, it's more about what Stanley Druckenmiller, his th thesis that he's been saying for many years, that it has to do with what central bank liquidity flows and how each central bank is dealing with things and that affects the flight capital where the uh, liquidity is going into which uh, asset prices? I think that's a big chunk of it. I mean, basically when you're when you, you analyze country by country, one is rule of law, right? D does does capital feel like it's respected where it is, or does it want to flee to a, a jurisdiction that it feels like um, has more rule of law to it? Another one is interest rate differentials, right? So if um, if a country doesn't have uh, interest rates that are enticing to foreign capital or that, that really make um, domestic capital want to flee, that's a factor. Uh, and then overall, just kind of um, quality of the assets that are available to them locally. I mean, China. So if you look at, say, priorities of different country governments, the US generally favors its corporate sector pretty heavily. Um, and so it usually doesn't heavily impair its corporate sector, like profits and stock prices, whereas China, they have very different priorities. And so, I mean, they crack down on their on their big um, stocks. They they kind of like, and when you, they change the rule frequently, you see a lot of domestic capital and foreign capital doesn't feel particularly comfortable in their equities. And so even though they're trading at rather low valuations, like they should be attractive value stocks, um, there's just not a ton of confidence. And so capital tends to want to pour outside of the country and go elsewhere. And so they either, you know, they drive up prices of Singapore real estate or they drive up prices of US equity market or they they buy Bitcoin or gold or similar assets like that. Or NVIDIA, which is yeah, I, I was just hearing the profits. I you were on Charles Payne shows earlier in Fox Business and he was talking about NVIDIA. And one of the guests has said that NVIDIA has 30% of the S P 500 gains alone this year, and the Nasdaq 100 and NVIDIA has 50% of the gains. Yeah, it's been absolutely massive. And I think um there's, I think there's two factors there. I mean, one is the fundamentals have been roaring, um, and because you know there's, there's clearly technology tends to come in stepwise bursts, right? And so now that kind of AI has reached a threshold where it's more commercial, more useful, um, there is kind of a stepwise burst in GPU usage and consumer usage of AI and business usage of AI. So I think that the fundamentals are real, but then of course, um, you know, valuations can get uh, quite high. Um, and so I don't necessarily refer to NVIDIA as a bubble. I just think it's a very crowded area. Like, I don't think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit left uh, in that particular trade. I think it's a bubble. I mean, anecdotally, I don't know about you, but like I have friends who had no interest in the stock market and I'm getting messages lately how they're making easy money trading stock options. So they're not even looking at fundamentals. They're just trading on charts and they don't know anything about the stock market. And they're making thousands of dollars a month trading like NVIDIA and stock options on S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100. Uh, just trading in the range. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal stories that we do have a bubble. The thing with a tech bubble, though, is you don't know on timing when it's going to crash. So it could go for a while. But um, I, we have smart investors like Stanley Druckenmiller. I mean, Stanley was in NVIDIA, I think, in 2021, 2022. He's the, the hedge fund managers are taking profits in these things and they're getting out and they're starting to asset rotate now. Yeah, it can be challenging. Like, I, I ran up the prior NVIDIA cycle. Like, so I bought it in, um, uh, like, say, 2018, 2019. So NVIDIA had a big run up in 2017, partially because of like, you know, Ethereum mining, for example, they sold a lot of GPUs. And after uh, crypto kind of blew up for that cycle, NVIDIA kind of went down with it. Um, and I, I got in back then uh, and wrote up uh, what I thought was a very aggressive stock price up until like, you know, kind of late 2021, uh, kind of like made multiples on that gain, uh, trimmed out of the position, and then it kind of fell throughout 2022. And, um, but th this second bull wave from like, you know, 2022 up to the current price has just been absolutely enormous. Um, and and so I, I do think that, you know, back when it was like half the price it is now, I was like, OK, it's it's, it's heavily bought, but I wouldn't call it a bubble necess necessarily because it's been backed up by fundamentals. But this this recent run here in 2024, I think is starting to potentially bring it to bubble territory. I mean, now it's over a $2 trillion market cap. 
I think it's one of the stocks that, you know, the size and importance of what they're doing is probably worth a trillion dollars or more. Um, but once you get into $2 trillion territory, I mean, that is just um, very heavily owned, let's say. So there's not, I, I don't think there's a lot of marginal capital that is still on the sidelines ready to pour in. Um, and I think that now it's kind of like any anything short of blowing past analyst expectations in any given quarter is is dangerous for a correction. They do have a market advantage for now, but over the next, I don't know if you looked at the projections, but over the next three to five years, I mean, Intel has a lot of semiconductor microchip factories under construction. Now, I mean, there's a lot of new supply of the semiconductor microchips competition, which tends to, as you said, with technology and free markets and capitalism, actual free markets, it produces beneficial deflation for the consumer. It hurts profit margins and lowers prices, which is good for the consumer and businesses in the long run. So I think there's going to be a lot of new supply coming online of these semiconductor chips in the next three to five years. There's a lot of foundries under construction right now. Yeah, I think NVIDIA will go through another big cycle, most likely. You know, uh, it's hard to say what point it'll reach before it goes in that cycle. How low will it get in that cycle? But I do think that there will likely be a big, a big volatility event that shakes a lot of people out, and probably overbuilding of capacity will be a part of that. Basically, right now, you know, due to concerns around shortages and stuff, everybody kind of pre-orders. And so if you do get any sort of softness in demand, um, I, I think there's a lot of reflexivity there for um, expectations uh, and just overall supply coming to market. Kind of like how commodities go through a boom-bust cycle, semiconductors tend to go through similar cycles. And I wouldn't be surprised to see another one in in like that time frame you mentioned, that kind of three to five year time horizon. Yeah, there's also a lot of ridiculous assumptions too in the Biden budget that the national debt's only going to be $45 trillion 10 years from now. I mean, I, I'm looking at problems in the banking system with the regional banks. BTFP is ending. It's supposed to end soon, but I'm skeptical if they're actually going to let it end or there'll be a new government program to replace it or, or they'll just extend it. Do you think that the problems in the regional banks and commercial real estate, have they just been delayed by 12 months because of BTFP and the problems are worse now? Uh, so they've, I think, partially been delayed. Um, it's also a size thing. So commercial real estate is not nearly as big as residential real estate. It's not as big as the stock market. Um, and so, you know, there's estimates that there might be, for example, $2 trillion in losses. But if you look at U.S. Uh, net worth, like look at all household net worth and like all the kind of business entities that they own, you know, it's something like $140 trillion. Um, And so I, I think basically what we're seeing is, I was talking before about kind of fiscal and monetary policy and how the, there's so much focus on monetary, not on fiscal. I think industries that are interest rate sensitive with commercial real estate being a key one because it's it's highly leveraged and it's shorter duration, right? So that's kind of a, a, a pretty damaging mix. Um, that commercial real estate is basically in a depression because they're more affected by the monetary policy than the fiscal policy. Whereas other other industries, uh, you know, travel and dining or tech or, you know, Costco or, you know, all these other kind of industries that are maybe less industry rate sensitive uh, and more on the side of fiscal, either directly or just because p- other people are receiving fiscal and then they're spending into the economy. Um, those areas are generally doing better. And the way I would phrase it is that the areas that are suffering, like commercial real estate, have thus far not been big enough to pull down the whole economy. Instead, they have this, this, these pockets of implosions. Uh, you'll see you know, big real estate funds suffer or an individual bank go down, for example. Um, but the scale, the sheer size of, of those failings has not so far been big enough to override the massive kind of deficit-driven nominal GDP growth you see in other sectors. So if we're running, let's call it $2 trillion deficits a year, and the cumulative losses in commercial real estate are about $2 trillion, uh, that's one year's worth of deficit. Um, and so the, the sheer sizes of the deficits are, are I think, um, pushing up against some of these uh, pockets that would otherwise be destabling or otherwise be disinflationary. So you don't think that this is 2005, 2006, and 2007 all over again with the banks and derivatives because commercial real estate doesn't have all those mortgage-backed securities and all the other derivatives tied to it then that could cause the banks to collapse like dominoes? So I don't I don't think it's big enough to reach the big banks. So basically back in the 2005, 2006, 2007, that I would describe as peak private uh, debt bubble. So if you look at, for example, total debt relative to the monetary base or uh, the money multiplier, so how how big is M2 relative to the monetary base 
all of those things were exceedingly high back then. Um, and deficits were not that big yet. Uh, and so when that happened, that was a huge implosion uh, for the private sector. And that that's when you saw like a fiscal burst. So for example, into the global financial crisis, there were very large deficits. They kind of brought a lot of the problems onto the public balance sheet. So back up to the the federal debt level, um, and then you know the whole 2010s decade where this 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 kind of economic stagnation because you still had some degree of private sector deleveraging. Uh, you had kind of the middle of the decade, you didn't have very large deficits. But as we got kind of later in that decade, and then particularly in the 2020s, I think that the overall forces of, of fiscal, uh, it, it's more fiscal driven. It's more of a, 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 I would describe the bubble has been in sovereign debt. The bubble has been in currencies, uh, which manifests in a very different way. It manifests in inflation. It manifests in the currency itself getting debased. And so I, I agree with people that there is a bubble. It's just that I, I you know, I think a lot of people look for what happened last time. So they, they, when they think of a problem, they often think of a gigantic banking crisis. They often think of a big deflationary debt collapse. Um, whereas I, I think there are pockets of that, um, but I think that the the biggest force overall is the bubble in sovereign debt, the the structural fiscal deficits that are basically unresolvable. Uh, for the U.S. federal government at this point, and that that's more likely to cause something that looks more like a crack-up boom, or looks more like a just kind of um, an emerging market characteristic. So if you look at emerging market recessions, you'll often see stock market up in nominal local currency terms. You'll see GDP growth nominally up in local currency terms. Uh, it doesn't feel like a developed market recession. Uh, but of course, if you measure things in dollar terms or gold terms, things are not doing well. And I think that's partially what we're seeing in the US today, that we have some emerging market characteristics because of our structural debt problem and deficit problem, that uh, things kind of run hot rather than run cold sharply in the way that people think. And running hot has its own problems. I mean, you know, you can have energy problems, you can have, uh, you know, inflation that they can't get back below their their target level and kind of keep it there. Uh, and these are, I kind of see the problems pointing more in that direction than in the kind of the, the debt implosion direction. Now, you can still have, I think we're, I think we're still going to see more regional bank failures. Um, that's so the problem right now is a commercial real estate is a problem. And then, um, regional banks that are heavily exposed to commercial real estate. I think that's still going to be a problem. Um, but the largest banks have relatively little commercial real estate as a percentage of their assets. So exposure to that. So I think what, what makes this one different is it doesn't, it doesn't hit. It's not like a kill shot against the biggest banks and, you, they're already running deficits that are like the size of the global financial crisis deficits before there's even a recession. They're already pre. They're already pre-stimulating. Basically, that that's kind of the effect that those deficits have. If you were to have a recession, those deficits would probably go up by another trillion or more. And so it just the the overall kind of backdrop is just running hotter than you would uh, in kind of that say late two thousands environment. Yeah, I think the average person and also like a, a lot of the people on business television, they won't talk about this a lot, maybe a little bit. They talk about the national debt, but they don't talk about all, how much all the different debt levels of society are up since 2008 financial crisis. I think corporate debt, a lot of it was because the Federal Reserve Bank did zero interest rate policies. So a lot of corporations, the S&P 500 companies were issuing tons of debt at cheaper rates and they were re refinancing it. So I think the amount of corporate debt has doubled since the 2008 financial crisis. A lot of it was locked in at lower rates, especially again in 2020 when the Fed lowered interest rates down to zero. And then the amount of total debt in society, I think global government debt I think the International Institute of Finance, I think it was around 200 trillion in 2008, and it's up about a, a hundred trillion over the last 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but one thing you have to look at is like, for example, if you compare that private sector debt to what GDP levels are, or compare to what money supply uh, for different countries are, um, some of those are below their, um, say, 2007 levels. So, for example, a common thing you'll see is people point out that credit card debt in the U.S. is at record highs, which is true. But if you look at credit card debt relative to GDP, or you look at credit card debt relative to total financial assets, um, it's lower. Um, now, that's is again, it's not necessarily a good thing because what what they did was they transferred a lot of the 
private sector debt onto the public ledger. Uh, uh, and basically, that's by running, but by bailing banks out, by doing stimulus checks, by doing PPP loans to turn into grants. Uh, we've now had two major crises of transferring private sector debts to the public sector. Uh, and so now I think there's while some of the debt to GDP metrics are not as high in the private sector as they were before, the public sector ones are you know higher than ever. Um, and so that's why I view the 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 bubble as having shifted from the private sector uh, more towards the public sector, meaning the debt, the the sovereign debt and the currency. I think that's still the key bubble. Um, but then, yeah, in the private sector, you still have pockets of bubbles. So, for example, commercial real estate and banks that lend to them. I think that's still a slow motion train wreck in, in action. Um, but it's just it's just offset by just such uh, kind of the sheer scale of deficits. Uh, it's it's kind of hard for, um, you know, it's just a very different environment is how I'd put it. Do you have a difference in definition between like fiscal dominance and financial repression or are they more or less the same thing? Generally, fiscal dominance leads to repression. Uh, that's usually one of the ways that they try to solve for it. Um, and the way I would phrase it is that the, the higher that public debt gets as a percentage of GDP, the less effective monetary policy gets at controlling inflation. So for example, in the 1970s, public debt to GDP was like 30%. Um, the majority of new money creation was from bank loans, uh, less so the deficits, although there were deficits as well, but bank lending was a bigger component of money creation because you had baby boomers entering their home buying years, so you had peak credit formation. Um, and when they wanted to slow down inflation, they raised rates super high, which um, on one hand, it did blow out the deficit because you you know you raise rates super high and the public debt is is paying those interest rates, but um, it slowed down private sector bank lending more uh, than it than it increased the deficit, and so that was overall a disinflationary force. But if you fast forward uh, and debt is a hundred twenty percent of GDP rather than thirty percent, then the problem is as you raise interest rates, um, uh, you. On one hand, you do slow down bank lending, uh, but you also blow out the fiscal deficit by an even bigger number. So if you compare, for example, uh, one number is you know annual fiscal deficit per year, right? That's one number. Another number is if you add up all new bank loans and all new corporate debt issuance in that year, uh, it used to be that that private sector stuff, the bank loans and the corporate debt issuance was bigger than the fiscal deficit in a given year. Um, and now we're in a period where it's flipped. So the fiscal deficit is bigger than all new bank loan and all new corporate bond issuance combined. Um, and so you you, you kind of, when you raise rates, it's less effective at controlling inflation because it's not addressing the, the core money creation area, which is more the fiscal side. It's basically a gigantic spender that's not sensitive to interest rates uh, because, you know, there are a lot of private sector decisions that will depend on interest rates, um, but there are not a lot of public sector decisions that will depend on interest rates. Uh, a lot of the entitlement stuff is just locked in. A lot of the military stuff is either locked in or tied to geopolitics. They're not looking at the Fed. Um, interest expense directly goes up if the, if the Federal Reserve raises uh, interest rates. And so fiscal dominance is basically when the, the public debt is so large uh, and the deficits are so structurally big, including the interest expense component of the public debt, that monetary policy just starts to lose its effectiveness. Uh, so that's fiscal dominance. Repression is sometimes, it, if they realize they're in that predicament, then sometimes what they'll do is not raise interest rates, even in the face of high inflation, because they realize that they're they're actually risking feeding into that inflation, ironically. And so sometimes instead, they'll do things like yield curve control, or they'll do more subtle types of yield curve control to keep yields submerged below the inflation rate and therefore try to inflate a lot of the debt away relative to nominal GDP growth. That, that's kind of a, a response to fiscal dominance. Um, and you know, back in the 1940s, they did it the blunt way. They just did outright yield curve control. Um, so you know, inflation averaged 6% for the decade. They held interest rates at 2.5% or less. Even when inflation spiked to 19% year over year at one point, they still held uh, interest rates, you know, depending on the part of the yield curve between zero and 2.5%. Um, currently, I think they would 
generally be a little more subtle with it. I mean, the the most recent proposal, for example, is to eliminate um, uh, SLR from banks to basically let banks kind of carry almost unlimited treasuries. And uh, even the bank term funding program, you can describe as kind of a very mild form of yield curve control. Um, and I think you'll see kind of programs like that, that whenever there's a problem in the treasury market, um, they provide liquidity in, in any number of ways. Uh, and so I, I think basically that you know, you get that environment of yields not necessarily reflecting what they would be if the you know only buyers were you know private sector non banks. So no bond vigilantes, more goalposts moving, more banks uh, getting in accounting rules changes or leverage ratio changes, so the banks absorb the treasuries. Then I think so. I mean, I, I think any bond vigilante victory will be short lived. Like if they when they start to win, which they had, you know, there's a couple, you know, in the past couple of years, you've had moments where the bond vigilantes are winning. Um, but if you have the ability to just change the rules. Uh, then you can beat the bond vigilantes. That's kind of what they do. Um, so basically, financial oppression is kind of like in response to the bond vigilantes. So um, I actually think partially the Federal Reserve wants to steepen the yield curve a little bit. Um, and so it's not necessarily the yields per se that would freak them out. It's more about liquidity. If there's like tailing auctions, if um, dollar index is, is kind of, you know, breaking up sharply, um, if just overall functioning in the treasure market is is just not working. Like, for example, during the repo spike of 2019 or during the March 2020 crash or during when, when the Bank of England had to step in and support their bond market, sometimes it's not about the yield per se. Sometimes it's about the, just the functioning and liquidity of the market. And I think that's the thing that they're kind of um, managing the most. I think at the heart of it, it's, it's a supply demand issue because you have both yeah. political parties, Congress, the five five hundred thirty eight in Congress, and it doesn't matter who has a majority. I mean, like they're not talking about serious spending cuts, <laughs> and yeah. so basically, it's a supply issue, the budget deficits, the supply issuance of treasuries, and then the major buyers of treasuries the last couple of decades that were doing the vendor financing, re- recycling uh, foreign exchange reserves and trade surpluses. So your China, Germany, Japan, they're not the buyers of treasuries in size they were the last couple of decades. Yeah, and that's I mean that's that's a case I've been making since 2019, and I think it's still in play. I mean, there's periods of time where there's buyers, but I think structurally the supply demand balance is is mixed, uh, and so you know the the past year they funded a lot of it with reverse repos, but that requires shortening the average duration of of government debt. Um, if they do the SLR uh, changes, they can get banks to eat more of them, um, but basically. Uh, Whenever they run into some sort of supply demand issue, uh, they won't really describe it as such. They'll describe it as a euphemism of, you know, treasury market functioning or, you know, adequate liquidity in capital markets. However, they want to describe it, they'll have something like repo operations or SLR changes or um, outright QE, uh, even if they're, say, above their official CPI targets. Um, I think that's kind of going to be the story for the next decade is, is that they don't want to describe it as monetizing the fiscal deficit. Um, but if, if they expand their balance sheet in any number of ways in response to treasury market illiquidity, and they get higher highs and higher lows in their overall size of their balance sheet, then that's, that's ends up being what they're doing. They're monetizing fiscal deficits, uh, through everything but name. And they're assuming that tax receipts are going to, in the bu- new Biden budget for 2025, that it's going to, tax receipts are going to increase by another trillion dollars at the federal level. That doesn't sound like they're going to allow deflation. Sounds like they want asset prices to remain inflated. They want inflation. They do not want to allow deflation for a long period of time because if there is deflation, there are bankruptcies, the consumer's not spending, asset prices stay low for six months more. That means potentially the tax receipts could collapse substantially by over 20%. Yeah, and that's the feedback loop that's in place. So it used to be that the economy kind of dictated where the stock market would go, but now the stock market's so big and we've, we've structured our tax system so much around asset price performance um, that where asset prices go can significantly affect tax revenue, uh, which which blows out the deficit even more. Um, so after years where the stock market does pretty well, um, the next couple quarters can have lower than expected deficits because um, you know the, ta- the basically capital gains, taxes, and other things like that are bringing in a decent amount of revenue. But anytime you have like a flattish stock market, um, that's pretty bad for tax revenue. And so you're more likely to get kind of surprised to the upside 
in the deficit because you have surprise to the downside in tax revenue. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a feedback loop is pr- locked in pretty hard and it feeds into the, the structural fiscal deficit backdrop, which makes this, you know, different, I would argue, than the global financial crisis. And in some ways more like a emerging market, just like a, a, an emerging market with U.S. characteristics. Well, in 2020, the Fed had to buy municipal debt, right? So they, And they weren't allowed before that to, to even think about buying corporate debt, but they got the rules changed. I listened to a speech that Jeff Gunlock gave back in a October Grant's interest rate conference. He hired someone from the Federal Reserve Bank, and they had a discussion about how they're not allowed to buy corporate debt. And then the people at the table, the governors, were like, well, let's just get our lawyers and, and others and the lobbyists to get the laws changed so then we could go buy corporate debt if we have to. Yeah, and that that's you know that's the system we live in. I mean, one of the things that argue in broken money is that by having such a flexible ledger, uh, it basically allows uh, entities that get close to the source of of money creation uh, to uh, benefit disproportionately, um, and then they have even greater influence over how the money creation system works. Since so you have that kind of that that connection between you know private markets and um the government you have that cronyism that takes hold because um you know they can print the base layer of money in any, in any number of ways and they can selectively bail out certain industries like in the in the global financial crisis they could bail out banks but chose not to bail out homeowners in the um you know the covid environment you know, everybody's, they kind of misdirected people with stimulus checks, but on the other hand, they were doing PPP loans to turn into grants. And so some people were getting, you know, $2,000 stimulus checks and there were other, there were like people running law firms or people running like investment research firms or investment management firms. They were getting, you know, 100,000, 250,000, 500,000 million dollar um, support that, that pretty much just went to their bottom line. Um, and so a lot of it's been a game of, as an entity, can you get on the right side of the fiscal deficits and have kind of structural support and and everyone kind of just lobbies and fights for their piece of the flexible ledger? Sounds like corruption tied to the cancel on effect with all that currency creation, the people at the front of the line not getting hit because they're benefiting their businesses or getting the extra the extra liquidity inflows or their asset prices. If they're they have a lot of stocks or own a lot of real estate, they're benefiting from that, too. Yes, exactly. Uh, last question here um, about energy situation, because the government can't print energy. In, in fact, I would argue every time these governments have tried to allocate capital to a lot of energy policy, they failed the last 15 or 20 years, especially on solar, wind, biofuels, electric vehicles. There's a lot of these electric vehicle companies that are failing. Do you think that there's going to be a lot more electricity usage going forward for these data centers and for artificial intelligence, Bitcoin mining, these things? So I think we see a couple factors in play. I do think so. The last call it twenty years of tech growth was not super energy intensive. In fact, you know, when a smart when smartphones took off, they replaced a lot of other devices that you need, right? So you kind of less material. A lot of things kind of folded in one in, into one device. And then social media is not particularly energy intensive. Um, software as a service is not particularly energy intensive in most cases. Um, and so overall, um, that you know had kind of a net neutral or a net positive effect on on you know kind of reducing energy usage uh, and and not really kind of um, paying a cost for it. Whereas I think the next 20 years are going to be more power intensive overall. I think the types of software we're seeing, like AI stuff, so image generation, thinking machines, um, kind of, you know, we, we, we outsourced a lot of human labor, uh, like physical labor. And I think now we're going to be like outsourcing a lot of thought, at least for things like accounting, things like, um, you know, just all sorts of, of, analysis all sorts of of creation of, of different things you know it on one hand is very efficient but it is going to be very power intensive um and very hardware intensive and so I, I think that's going to be a big theme over the next 10 20 years um and i think that you know that say the u.s grid for example has been relatively stagnant in terms of overall throughput and i think that that's probably going to going to break out to the upside in, in the decades ahead. And so there will be, need to be new power plants, new um, transmission uh, infrastructure, uh, and that can result in, in bottlenecks. And then in addition to that, um, you know, because there's been so much investment in, uh, you know, 
EVs and solar and wind and things like that. And I would argue not not necessarily enough investment in hydrocarbons. Um, I think or, that or nuclear, yeah, yeah, or nuclear. Um, I I think in the years ahead, uh, we're probably due for another energy price uh, cycle and a capex cycle. Um, I think that you know the low hanging fruit in shale in U.S. shale is behind us. It doesn't mean that you know shale is going to roll over tomorrow, but it just means that the 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 rate of change that it's gone up, I think, is going to slow. Um, and you know, in the past couple of years, I mean, we had the SLR, the strategic, I mean, the the, the SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, drawing down. Uh, we had weak demand from China. Um, because they were kind of running the opposite playbook of the U.S., they were not doing a lot of fiscal. Um, you know, uh, we've had deindustrialization in Europe partially, so uh, we've had kind of this um, mild demand destruction in energy. Uh, we've had a decent amount of supply, like you know, shale shale coming to market, um, other other kind of oil sources coming to market. Uh, but I think in the years ahead, it'll be a, a continue to be a relatively tight market. Um, and so I think that we're probably going to see a whole nother cycle of energy prices, energy capex uh, until we kind of come to a more solid place. So I, I do think that's a, a background investment opportunity. Um, and no one's like, there's, that's not a crowded space at all. Everybody's, everybody's stuffed into all like the mega cap, U.S. tech and even like the Costco's at fifty times earnings, whereas you could buy energy majors for, you know, eight to twelve times earnings. Strong balance sheets, um, uh, you know, they're profitable at current oil prices and gas prices. But if if those prices were to break out, they would have a lot of upside exposure. So I would, you know, if I was heavily in tech, I would at least hedge by owning some of these energy spaces. Um, and as a, as a more of a value oriented person, I'm, I, I lean towards overweight, uh, towards those, you know, energy and materials types of investments. There are small cap and mid cap U S and Canadian oil producers now at 30% to 50% discounts to net asset value with a lot of free cash flow and dividend yields above 4%. There's a lot of them right now. Yeah. And I think a lot of them are acquisition targets. Um, and even even just the big ones. I mean, you know, I think if if someone if someone can take the time and go down to the small and, and mid ones, uh, I think that they can be rewarded with with superior returns. But if they're a general investor and they don't necessarily want to look at individual companies too much, I think even even the big ones are just great values. So I, I, there's 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 no particular part of the energy. Um, industry that I'm I'm particularly bearish on. I think some of the drillers are interesting. I think there's a handful of midstreams that are interesting, and I, and I think a lot of the producers are interesting. So you think the asset rotation that a top hedge fund manager with a 30 year plus track record of success like Stanley Druckmiller, how he's taken profits on his Nvidia artificial intelligence and large cap tech stocks, and he's rotating into gold mining stocks, into oil and natural gas producers, base metal miners. These are profitable companies, low price to earnings ratio. Some of them have pretty decent dividend yields and free free cash flow. You think that over I don't know the next couple of years that that's probably some of those bets are going to pay off a lot. I, I think so. I mean, I mean, two years is you know anything can happen in two years. I think if you're if you're fundamental investing, I think a three to five year time horizon is helpful. Um, we also see, I mean, at, at at Berkshire, there's not a lot that Buffett's buying, but what he is buying is energy. Um, and you know, like a few years ago, he did a really good trade on the uh, Japanese commodity trading houses. Um, you know, he basically borrowed yen for almost almost no almost no interest, and he bought these. Um, you know, these Japanese kind of commodity and infrastructure plays. Um, and they performed great. Uh, they, they were huge plays. He's still holding them. They're kind of a long-term structural position for him. And lately, he's been buying all these energy majors. He's buying Chevron. He's buying Occidental. Um, it's kind of the only area that he, he, he seems particularly, particularly interested in accumulating. And I think he's right on that. I think that, um, you know, Buff is not known for his tech stocks picks per se. Uh, but in the value realm, he's usually pretty spot on. And I think he's been right for um, accumulating energy. I think it's going to pay off in the years ahead for his company. We're going to need a lot more cheap electricity going forward for pretty much everything. These emerging markets that are adding new infrastructure and people are getting onto the internet and actually using electricity. And also like all these data centers. I mean, I live in an area, the DC metro area. We have the most data centers uh, under construction right now. Yeah. Our local huge, power- huge. Hmm? Huge. Yeah. And getting bigger. Um, there's already the power company here, Local One Dominion, 
uh, Electric, Dominion Energy, they just disclosed in December that uh, 20% of the annual state power usage, electricity usage is just from data centers. And there's so many more data centers under construction. Yeah, I think the two the two big themes for power in developed countries, a lot of it's going to be data centers. And in developing countries, like let's say India, the ones with decent demographics uh, and also just still low energy usage per capita, I, I think that those are going to continue rising. Um, and so I think that it's a structural backdrop to be long, various ways to produce energy um, you know, effectively or ways to transmit energy and the materials needed to do that. So I think that there's a that that's going to be, I think, a long cycle and it can require patience, but a lot of them pay you to own them. A lot of them are, you know, even if they don't break out in the next year or two, they're paying you to own them uh, and they're reasonably priced. And then, you know, it's timing is always the hard part, but I do think in the years ahead, we're going to see another big cycle in that direction. And also U.S. infrastructure. I mean, we need to upgrade. I know like all these infrastructure bills get passed, but so many of the funds are wasted, abused, stolen. It's not even funny. It's really funny, though, with like the Davos crowd and those guys. So they try to issue all these policies like we're banning fossil fuels. We're going to phase out all internal combustion engine cars by 2030. And yet I think coal demand hit a record high in 2023. And now like these governments are doing a 180 on nuclear power. So it's just showing that a lot of the policy decisions for energy for a lot of these governments uh, for re, re, uh, investment return, they're allocating capital to energy for the last 15 or 20 years have been very, very bad. I agree. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that feeds into the current bull thesis that as as capital pivots away from things that are not working towards more dense sources of energy, um, you know, that, that those dense sources of energy are still cheap. And I think, um, you know, I think I think they have a big runway ahead still. Last question about gold and silver then. So you think if energy costs rise, gold mining is becoming more difficult, similar to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin's meant to kind of be like digital gold for, for mining. Do you think that the cost for all these mining things, whether it's copper, silver, uh, gold, all these other metals, the cost is going to have to rise. So the metals price is going to have to rise too? Yeah, I think over time, I mean, any met any metal that's in significant demand, um, you know, I think would rise. Um, you know, if if... if you know, if an if a metal has a lot of stock to flow, like for example, there's a lot of gold out there. So if if gold mining slows down, if there's insufficient demand for gold, um, there is plenty of supply from existing holders. So if you have a combination of a lot of people want it, so a lot of demand for it, and a tight mining situation, then that can be bullish. And I think you know, I think I'm bullish on copper. I'm bullish on gold. Uh, bullish on a number of metals. Uh, in addition to the whole energy complex. Well, I mean, there is a lot of gold above ground, but a lot of it's own in religious artifacts. So I think even if gold hit like five or $10,000, I don't think people would sell that gold. I think the religious temples in India and other parts of Asia, I don't think they'd go out and melt the gold down and sell it off uh, in coins of bars. <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah, that's 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 the last thing that would ever be melted down. I'm, I'm talking more about like the ETFs, um, some of the large holders that might want to rotate elsewhere. There is kind of, you know, it's not that hard to unlock one or 2% of the gold supply, which is equal to like a year's worth of production. Um, but yeah, once you start digging into the deeper layers, that that's where you're not going to, I think, get a lot of sellers. Well, there's there's not a lot of demand for gold by Western investors. I know people are buying stuff at Costco, but like if you speak to bullion dealers here in the US and Canada, I mean, there's not a lot of demand. They have a lot of inventory. They're having sales and marking down and then look at the outflows out of GLD. I mean, there is a lot of demand for gold. But as you said earlier in the interview, it's from non-G7 central banks because they, they said, OK, we've had enough of treasuries. You're issuing too much supply. We already have enough treasuries. We don't want to go buy more. And then private sector demand for gold from like China, India, Turkey, emerging markets. Yep, that's exactly how it's going. Well, Lynn, I really enjoyed our conversation today. I wish we had more time to talk. If my listeners want to check out your newsletter, follow you on Twitter, or buy your book, how do they do so? Uh, so Broken Money is available on Amazon and elsewhere. Uh, they can also go to lynnalden.com to see my work. And on Twitter, I'm at Lynn Alden Contact. And I always appreciate our discussions.